Hello and welcome back to Sotriology 101. Today we're going to be replying to our friend and colleague Chris Date, uh, who is a fellow worker with um, us, a professor there at Trinity Seminary and uh, a college I highly recommend if you're looking for a good place for a higher education. We've got Calvinists and non-Calvinists who actually uh, teach uh, as professors at Trinity and uh, we would love for you to consider that. Also, if you're not a supporter, click on the links there in the show notes so that you could become a supporter, uh, make a one-time donation. Use Zelle uh, if you don't want any fees taken out, uh, and you can also set up Zelle to make uh, monthly donations. And so that helps us so much when people give to help us promote the, the, pr the provision and love of God for all people. If I seem a little slow today, it may be because I'm running a, a low-grade fever. I'm not feeling uh, 100%, but I, I I've been wanting to get this out for a couple of weeks now, and I didn't have really much other time in my schedule to do so. And it's been a while since I've done a live broadcast, as some of you may have noticed. And so uh, despite the way I'm, I'm feeling at the moment, I decided to go ahead and jump on here and, and respond to Chris Dates. Uh, I guess he's done several other broadcasts since then, um, but he, he did a broadcast replying in part to me and others with regard to how uh, the word helco or draw is used in John 6, 44. And of course, this is a, a, a hot topic debate when, when it comes to Calvinism and Arminianism and provisionism. Uh, you, you often hear uh, this, this conversation kind of going back and forth. Uh, and so uh, I, I know that uh, people are, who are the theology geeks, the nerds are gonna be interested in this kind of content. Uh, some of you who are just passerbys may see and hear something like this and go, oh, boring. But us theology geeks, we, we like to dive in deep. And uh, Chris is, uh, one of the best to push us to go deeper and to, to help us to think more deeply. He is very meticulous in his um, responses. I think uh, Chris is a very a very careful scholar. Sometimes he might not think of me as being very serious because I'm not maybe as in depth and uh, careful as he is. Um, and uh, but I, he can't say that I'm I'm not trying to be serious or or that I ignore him. I have meticulously gone through many of his arguments. I may not always be persuaded by his arguments, but that doesn't mean I'm not serious or uh, willing to engage, which is a, kind of a passing comment he he uh, kind of threw out there in a, in a recent episode. Yeah, it did hurt my feelings. I, I, I'll be really honest, Chris. It did hurt my feelings a little bit because I really have tried to engage your arguments well. Maybe I'm not at the, the level uh, of the scholars that you mentioned from Dillard's, but um, I am trying. Uh, and so to, to insinuate that I'm not serious or I'm not really uh, seeking to engage your arguments, I think it's a bit unfair, just, just saying. Um, nevertheless, I do want to try to give him a hearing in this particular broadcast. Um, and, and I could possibly accuse Chris of not being serious with regard to um, really engaging with my particular belief because um, as I made the point in the debate with uh, Gabriel Hughes, is not only do the Calvinists have the burden to prove that the word drawing there is effectual, but they also have to demonstrate that it's unconditional. In other words, that the reason God is drawing somebody is unconditional because he unilaterally picks somebody before the foundation of the world and he's unconditionally drawing them. Now, this is probably the biggest of the points that I made and yet was virtually unaddressed by Chris Date. Uh, he did quote from an old article um, where I mentioned Judas in, in passing about him not being saved, and he kind of focuses on that and kind of ignores the rest of this point of argumentation, which, by the way, I think David Pullman, uh, uh, who I've had on the program, agrees with me on this particular aspect of it, of the unconditional aspect of it. And so I, I wouldn't say that Chris is not serious because he's very serious and he's usually very good at engaging with arguments, but he virtually ignored everything we've said about the unconditionality of the concept of the drawing. And, and I would just want to challenge him. Hopefully he watches this and he'll see that m maybe uh, it was unintentional that he didn't address the major point of my interpretation with regard to Helco. Um, and, and maybe that might be my fault because uh, my views have developed and grown over the years. And maybe in an older article, I didn't emphasize that as well or as clearly as I should. And he was going off of that. That's very possible. And so I'll give him the benefit of, of the doubt with regard to that. So um, let, let's, let's let Chris speak. I, he's got a long video. It's, a, it's almost a two hour long video and another two hour long video right after that, replying to, um, uh, to some other uh, guys who had uh, 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 confronted him about his position. And so there's a lot of material. And so I couldn't, I couldn't obviously get to, to even a, a fraction of it for us to be able to have time to cover it in this particular discussion. So I put a link in the show note for you to go watch the uh, the entirety of his broadcast. I encourage you to do that like I always do. 
please uh, go and listen and and give him feel, fair hearing. Uh, I hope he would tell you to do the same for my material. I'm not sure that I have ever heard him say that, but um, nevertheless, um, I, I encourage you to go listen to his material, hear him out, and and be good Bereans and judge for yourself um, who's who's being as you know clear with the text as possible, uh, which is the most natural reading of the text given the context of the scripture, given uh, the historical context of Jesus hiding the, the truth from the hardened Pharisees and parables and and not revealing himself to them and not drawing all to himself, all the, that context, which again, Chris doesn't even touch on in his his rebuttal. He, he, he only focuses on the syntax and the gr- grammatical aspects of the effectuality of drawing. And maybe that was just the, the purpose of that particular broadcast and that's all he wanted to focus on. But um, if, uh, if you really want to confront take it seriously our position you really should should take the the whole argument not just uh, one defeater within the argument all right with that said let's uh, let's listen to chris now in english the the word draw has a wide semantic range and sometimes it means some something like attract in 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 a very in a in a very psychological sense not necessarily a magnetic sense um a kind of drawing that doesn't necessarily affect a change of position. It's it's more like a, a, f- a force pulling at them, but it may or may not be effectual, right? It may or may not affect the change. But even though the English word has that kind of concept within its semantic domain, it's not clear to us Calvinists that the Greek word translated draws does. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Okay, so if English the English word draw has that limitation because it has a range of meaning that is broader than the Calvinist like, then why has every translator used the word draw? Why not use the word compel? In other words, if the word compel is a better English word, then why don't any of the translations use the word compel? In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that the the fact that every single English translation has chosen a word that in English can be understood as effectual or not necessarily effectual, then that goes to at least provide at least one point on our side of the debate. Now, it's not, it doesn't prove that we're right. I mean, all the translators could be wrong. All the translators, maybe you could argue they should have used the word compel in order to be consistent with the whole of scripture. Um, but that's, that's a pretty big burden for you to prove that every translator uh, failed in choosing the right English word to to connote the meaning of this particular text. Um, but there's another point here that Chris made, is that he he's talking about um, the word Helco bringing up a person to, let me use the word, to effect a change of position, okay? Now, th- this is what I'm going to invoke a little bit of what Brian Wagner said when we talked about this, is that we do believe that when God draws, there's an affected change of position. Um, it's it's like every evangelist you've ever heard out there. If you've done street evangelism or you've you've listened to an evangelist preach, uh, to and he, they would say to to not decide is to decide. So what are they saying? You you now have no excuse. You are now in a different position than you were before because now you know the truth. So if you didn't know the truth, then you wouldn't be accountable. Jesus says, but now you know the truth. You're in a different position now because now you've been drawn. Now you've been enabled. Now you've been invited. Now you've been informed. Now you have the light and you have to make a decision. You have now come to a fork in the road to where you must choose as to which way you will go. So just to say, and I know what Chris means by to effectuate a change of position, I know what he means by it, but he's he's very careful with his words and he wants to be very uh, specific. And if he wants to be very specific and accurate, he should say to effectuate a positive change of position in the direction that the drawer or the one drawing in wants or, or is, is causing, or effectuating, right? In other words, it, it can't be just that there's a change of position. It has to be that you're effectuating a change of position um, in, in an effectual way. And of course, we know that's what Chris means. And so I'm, trying, I'm not trying to nitpick him, but I'm just trying to make that point that we do believe uh, when someone's drawn by the Father, there is a change that takes place. Um, and we do believe that that change um, affects, affects something within the person. A person can be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, being drawn by the Holy Spirit, and that affects a change in them. And they can still resist Him. Just like uh, Acts seven twenty one says, they resisted the Holy Spirit, just like your fathers before Him. So what are they doing? 
their, their, their position is being uh, um, changed in the sense that they are being convicted. They are being drawn to something. They are being pushed to something, but yet they're still resisting that drawing. They're resisting that, um, that, that moving of the spirit. And whose fault's that? It's their fault. It's not a lacking of the spirit. It's not, it's not a lack of sufficiency or lack of desire on God's part. It's, it's their own fault not God's. And so that's why we, we continually focus on this is because we want to keep the blameworthiness on the center. We don't want to put it on some secret will of God or some d- secret decree of God. We, we want to keep the blame where blame is due. And that is on the center who resists the, the calling and the drawing, the invitation, whatever other words you want to use there. We want to keep the blame where blame is due. And that's kind of the reason for this particular focus. And so um, this is the, the debate slide that I used in my debate with Pastor Hughes, which Chris actually plays this section of me talking through this, and that's why I'm, I'm just kind of highlighting it again. Because what I did here in the debate is kind of put side by side uh, the, the, uh, another grammatical construct of John 6, 44. Um, John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And, and I said a, a, a parallel grammatical structure could be something like, no man can come to the son's wedding banquet unless the father invites or enables him. And he, the man who comes, will have a great feast. And so it's, it's connoting what we believe could be a possible way to interpret this text, okay? And so that's one way to understand that you can't come unless you've been invited or enabled by the Father, but it doesn't necessarily mean you will come just because you're invited or you're enabled by the Father. That's one defeater, in in a sense, to the Calvinistic rendering of this text. Now, we'll get to the other defeater, which Chris doesn't really address, and maybe that wasn't the purpose of his discussion. That's fine, but it's, it's the it's the bigger of the two in my estimation. And I think Paulman and others would, would agree with me on that point uh, that we've, we've talked about before. Uh, Matt Chisholm was on and he, he holds to the same perspective. And, uh, and, and Chris just really hasn't addressed that yet. Um, and so I, I make this point and I say, can someone can, notice the word can, not just may, may they come, no. They, can they come to the, the wedding feast unless they're invited. No, they cannot come. They have to have, you cannot enter without an invitation. You have to have an invitation. So it's not just granting people permission to come as he's gonna accuse me of here in a minute. It's, it's you're not enabled to, you don't have the power to, you don't have the ability to come unless you have been invited, okay? But if they are invited, does that mean they necessarily will come? No, doesn't mean they necessarily will come, which is, uh, what he goes on to talk about here next. And I think that there are some problems with Dr. Flowers' claims. Um, for example, it seems to me that if Helkuo or Helko, as Dr. Flowers pronounced it, is to be translated invites, or if it means to invite, then what? The, then the um, phrase that Dr. Flowers has offered as, a, as an analogous, a grammatically analogous phrase, equivocates on the meaning of the word can. Because in John 6.44, the word can refers to capacity or ability. No one is capable of coming to me. But in Dr. Flowers' proposed alternative, the word can means may or is permitted. No one is permitted to come to the son's wedding banquet unless the father invites him. Okay, and that's not what I believe. Um, I I, I think that the ability is, uh, which I go on to the very next slide that he stopped at, the very next slide says, the Father's invitation, like his drawing, is necessary. So it's not just about granting permission. It's necessary. It's a necessary condition for the man to come. But that does not mean everyone who is invited will necessarily come. By the way, I think William Lane Craig said almost exactly those same words in his Defenders Conference. So I, the reason I say things like that is because there's parts of me, especially when I'm confronting someone like Chris Date, because he's a smart guy. He's, he's much more intelligent than I ever hoped to be, and I know that. Um, I I like to quote from smarter people than me to say, okay, I'm not the only doofus holding to this. Okay. There's, there's, there's smart people who believe and say the exact same things I'm saying. A lot of my material guys, I'm not getting for myself. I'm, I'm, it's from reading scholars. Okay. Just my own insecurity there uh, coming through. So, um, also how many times have you heard me quote from Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? Not how many may call, like how many need permission to call on the one they believe in? How, how many need permission to believe in one whom they've not heard? Is that what I ever say? No, I say they can't. You can't believe in somebody you don't know exists, can you? 
No. You can't come to a party you don't know is happening, can you? No. You can't do it. Dunatai, as he mentions, you can't. You, it is a cannot. It's a real cannot. It is impossible to believe in someone you have never heard of. And how can they hear without someone preaching? They can't. Okay, Someone has to proclaim it. If they have to read it. They have to hear it. It has to be uh, told to them. They have to be informed. That is a real cannot. And you've heard me many, many times uh, talk, talk about that. So the next thing I move to, and this is the slides from the de actual debate, so that you know that um, this is the things that he's, he's responding to, at least in, in part, some of these things from the debate. And so um, I wrote this. In order for John 644 to uniquely support Calvinism, the word draw, or helco there, must connote God's work is, one, effectual, like I, like I said earlier, and two, limited, meaning the, the unconditional election, limited to the unconditionally elect. And so that's the point I was making earlier, is that the burden is twofold. You have to show that it's effectual, which Chris Date does attack, but you also have to show it's limited to the unconditionally elected ones, secondly. Okay, And he really doesn't touch on that. But notice the word regeneration right there, because Pastor Hughes, as well as R.C. Sproul, and every Calvinist that I'm very familiar with on this subject, says that regeneration precedes faith and that regeneration is new life, rebirth, new birth, in fact. Um, and listen to what Chris Date says about that. Is can helkuo or helko refer to an action that doesn't affect the change of position? That's the question we want to look at. By the way, Dr. Flowers' line of reasoning, in my estimation, that we just saw in his cross-examination with Gabriel Hughes, would not work against my view because I don't think regeneration is a bringing to life. Okay, so he doesn't think regeneration is bringing to life. That's news to me. If nothing else, it's a very idiosyncratic position, as far as I can tell. Um, I, I would love to have, maybe, maybe we can have Chris on to talk about this because that's, that's an interesting discussion to think that the word regeneration doesn't mean to be brought new life, new birth. I, this is Easton's Bible Dictionary, which is one of the most popular. Uh, Baker's is, is exact. Matter of fact, I looked up on Baker's <laughs> evangel, uh, Evangelical Dictionary, which is the other big one that almost everybody has on their shelf, um, every theologian and pastor that I'm aware of anyway. Um, it even it even says just see new birth. I mean that's what it says. See new birth under regeneration, um, and and you can see the definition there. Uh, the word literally means new birth. The Greek word surrendered is used by classical writers with reference to changes produced by returning of spring. The word is equivalent to the restitution of all things. Denotes a change of heart. Uh, elsewhere spoken of as passing from death to what to life. Passing from death. To life, resurrection from the dead, renewal of the mind, to be quickened, to be born again. Uh, he, he seems to have a very, very idiosyncratic position, even different from most Calvinists, at least that I'm aware of on that point. And so I, I don't say that to, to say that he can't be right. I'm just saying when you speak with dogmatism about a particular position and your view is very idiosyncratic, you know, you, you have a, you, your burden is even higher than maybe Pastor Hughes's was because not only do you have to prove your position? You have to prove your position in opposition to almost every other scholar that I'm aware of, at least. But again, I will I will hold a reserve, uh, you know, full judgment on what he goes on to say because his he, he didn't cover that. And so you, you know how Proverbs says you got to hear out somebody's argument before you make a decision. Let's give him fair hearing on that point and understand what he means by saying regeneration doesn't mean uh, to be brought new life. Um, okay, moving on to the next portion here. Um, in this section, what he does, what you'll notice here, he does, and he and it's a long video, and he goes through a lot of stuff, and I just don't have time to go through it all, so I got a couple of screen grabs here. And most of the examples that he uses, starting in the book of John, is inanimate objects, okay, using the word helco in reference to inanimate objects. So I drew the stapler, which we would never say I drew a stapler. You'd say I moved the stapler, right? I moved the stapler from this desk to this desk right? An inanimate object. And that would connote a compelling kind of thing because the stapler doesn't have a will. It can't resist, right? So I moved the stapler. Um, the word move could be a good word in English to kind of illustrate this. Um, you could say, I was moved by the pastor's sermon to walk the aisle. I was moved by the pastor's sermon to walk the aisle, okay? Now, does the word move there in connotation with a human being 
uh, connote the concept and idea of effectuality? In other words, he could not have done anything but walk the aisle? I don't think so. He could have said, I was moved by the pastor's sermon, but I was also embarrassed, so I resisted and remained in my chair. So he was still moved by the sermon, but he resisted the call to go forward, and he stayed in his chair. In both situations, he is moved, okay? Um, but in one situation, because he's not a stapler, he actually has a brain and a will, um, he, he resisted that movement and that feeling that he had. So you get those examples. So instead of disqualifying all of the texts that he reads that are about inanimate objects, he, it seems like he, again, maybe it's my bias, I admit that, he seems to hyper-focus on those. He disqualifies a lot of other texts because they're not as semantically relevant in his estimation, and I would have some issues with some of those uh, reasons for why they're not semantically relevant, which we'll get into a little bit maybe later. But if anything would disqualify a text from not being relevant would be if it's talking about inanimate objects. <laughs> and instead of leaving those out, he seems to hyper-focus on those. And I can understand why because inanimate objects can't resist. They don't have a will. And so, yeah, Helco is going to sound like it's irresistible. It's uh, unable to be resisted um, when, when you're using the word Helco with regard to an inanimate objects. Um, he uses this with Joes jo Josephus, and he has a lot of other, I mean, he must have spent hours upon hours putting this together. And maybe that's why he doesn't think I'm a serious scholar, because I don't put as much time into my presentations. I'm doing this as a live broadcast after, you know, uh, maybe an hour and a half of, of preparation. Maybe that's why he doesn't consider my, my reply serious. I, I'm not sure why. But nevertheless, um, he, notice here, the, these is about uh, shekels. It's, it's about inanimate objects. And he's using those as his examples as, as to, to demonstrate how Helco um, must be a compelling or a, an effectual kind of uh, a meaning of the terms. But let's see what else he says here with regard to that. The more historical um, gold standard, BDAG, Bauer, Donker, um, Arndt, and Gingrich, um, offers as the first meaning of this word to move an object from one area to another. Um, in fact, the... Okay, and that's what I was talking about, to move the object from one area to another. So to move a stapler, okay? To move an object from one area to, a, to another. Um, that would be a, a, that would carry a more obviously compelling component because it's an inanimate object that doesn't have a will of its own. Just like if you were compelling a, a people, like dragging them in the courtyard, like the, another time it's used in Acts, I believe it is, where they're dragging Paul and Silas into the courtyard or something of that nature, they can be resisting that. Okay, um, and, it, and it, you know, but they're they're compelling them, and so uh, it you're still using physical force, so to speak, in that first definition of BDAG, that's kind of what it's talking about. It's kind of a physical, using inanimate objects or forcing somebody with physical force to do something. And uh, he's acknowledging that from BDAG there. The location is very often that the object being moved is incapable of propelling itself or unwilling to do so voluntarily. Okay, so it's incapable of compelling itself because obviously a stapler is incapable of compelling itself, right? And so it would need to be moved, drawn, hell code, whatever uh, verb you want to use there, right? Okay. Or like Paul and Silas, they're unwilling to go uh, before the tribunal or get stoned with rocks or whatever it is. And so you'd have to drag them, uh, kicking and screaming, so to speak, compelled against their will. Now, what's interesting about that is Calvinists are very quick to say, that's not what's happening in John 6, 44, because they don't want say, to say that people are being physically forced against their will to believe in Jesus or to come to Christ. But what do they say? No, your will is changed. You're regenerated which Chris doesn't believe this is regeneration, but Pastor Hughes does. And so that's who I was obviously confronting, that he believes there was a regeneration changing their will to make them voluntarily want to come to Jesus. Okay, So it doesn't seem to me point number one in BDAG is relevant to the interpretation of John 6.44. And, and I'm not sure why it is that Chris Date posts this as his example and then goes through his whole dialogue only at the hour and 30 minute mark to finally pull in point two of BDAG so as to refute it, which we're going to see here in just a second. You see, this is um, drawn not in, in any loose sense within the semantic range of 
draw, the English word draw, that doesn't, that's not what this word appears to mean. It appears to us Calvinists anyway to mean in John 66. It seems to mean something more like drag, to affect a change of position from one place to another. Okay, so he seems to be taking point one's definition of BDAG in order to support his position, yet that's not what BDAG does, as you'll see. But non-Calvinists sometimes disagree with us on that specific point. So, so does BDAG, okay? Now, somebody mentioned way back an hour and 15 minutes ago, roughly, that the second definition um, of Helkuo in Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich might support a more enticing, wooing kind of reading. And that's because in BDAG, the second definition of Helkuo is to draw a person in the direction of values for inner life, to draw, to attract. And or to entice is another word that's used there. To entice, to draw, to attract, to lead, all, all which have to do with what? A human being, right? Not an inanimate object. So BDAG's, which it even uses, John 6, 44, as its example for point number two, yet Chris, earlier in the program, an hour and 15 minutes earlier, as he just mentioned, points to point number one of BDAG as if it's the better appropriate use of the word. The authors of BDAG disagree with him, and he doesn't seem to indicate that to his audience. The one single text that they cite in the New Testament as an example where it means that is the very text we're looking at now, John 6, 44. And so you might be inclined to think, well, shoot, maybe, maybe it can mean enable or invite in a way that doesn't necessarily affect a change. Well, no, we've just seen that the word has no room in its semantic range for that. And by the way, this definition doesn't say attract in a way that may or may not be resisted. It doesn't say attract in a way that might affect change but also could be resisted and therefore not affect the change. No. It just says that the attraction or the drawing is psychological, it's emotional, it's spiritual rather than physical. It has to do with a person rather than an inanimate object. That's the biggest difference between the two. It has to do with drawing a person with an actual will of their own versus drawing an inanimate object. That's the difference between the two. And interestingly enough, one of the examples in John 21, I believe it is, they try to draw a load of fish in and can't because it's too heavy. So it's like trying to pick up the stapler and it's glued to the table. And so I'm trying to draw it and it's not working. It's, it's, it's able to resist, even though it's an aminate object for you know, physical reasons, obviously. The fish were too heavy. So there's an example of Helco, even with inanimate objects, where it actually fails in doing the intended of the intention of the drawer. It doesn't mean the word changes. The word's still the same, even when the the physical object is is not able to be drawn. So they're they're attempting to draw the fish of uh, the fish in, and we're unable to do so. But the word Helco is still is still used, even when it fails to accomplish uh, the 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 drawing uh, the 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 agent who is wanting to draw, it fails in their intention to draw, okay? It still used the word Helco. And just because the drawing is psychological doesn't mean it's not effectual. So this second definition in BDAG... Okay, mark down what he said there. Just because the drawing is psychological does not mean it's effectual. Keep that in does mind. Does not support an invite or enable reading of John 6.44. Okay, so I would say in response to that, just because the drawing of an inanimate object is effectual doesn't mean the drawing of an accountable person with a free moral will is effectual. So he seems to be just ad hoc claiming, hey, just, just because this is about a person doesn't mean it's not also just as effectual as the stapler. Just because um, you know, you know, the, it, it's effectual with a stapler doesn't mean it's not effectual with a human being when it's using psychological reasoning. Doesn't, well, I could say just the opposite. Just because the drawing is effectual with an inanimate object doesn't make it um, effectual with a free moral agent who has a will of their own. You can't just assume you're reading, um, which is, again, why I think BDAG has uh, two, two possible choices with regard to, to uh, the semantic use of the word and how it's used. And, and, and Chris Dake disagrees with BDAG, and, and he, he should just come right out and say that real clearly to his audience. I, I disagree with BDAG and their conclusions, the scholars' conclusions, with regard to using point two as the, the appropriate definition of uh, John 6.44. All right, so this is my screen, uh, again, from the debate, and where I use the word Helco again, I reference BDAG, and I say it's a standard for New Testament scholarship, 
And I point to what? Point number two, because I think it's the appropriate one, is to draw a person in the direction of values for interlife, to draw, to attract, to entice, okay? That is an appropriate use of the word. In other words, the word draw, as he already confessed in that very first clip, connoted in the English language, is an appropriate word to use, like every English translation uses, okay? They could have used the word compel. We have English words that mean effectuality. It could say effectually draw. It could, it, I mean, if the translators believe the word helco really connotes what Chris Date thinks it connotes, they have English words that they could use that don't have any ambiguity with regard to that uh, meaning. So why don't they? You've got to ask yourself that question. You've got to, you've got to struggle with that yourself, okay? Um, Dr. Carl Olson wrote this regard to what BDAG says. Note that the primary literal meaning of the verb to draw or to drag has reference to physical objects, the stapler, whereas the figurative usage is in reference to the inner life of a person. So the phys fig figurative or psychological point number two, the use of point number two in BDAG is in reference to an actual living human being with a will. And you have to acknowledge the difference between those two things. And if anything should be disqualified in all of the examples that Chris Date lists, if anything should be disqualified is irrelevant, because he talks about, he disqualifies a lot of them as being irrelevant. If anything should disqualify any of them as being irrelevant, it's when they're in reference to a object or in reference to physical force um, versus psychological uh, wooing or drawing or enticing um, as, as the examples are given. Um, let's look at, at the next section here. Now, in John 6.44, remember what we're looking, and this is why the syntax effect on semantic domain is really important. We're not, in John 6.44, we're not concerned merely with the word helkuo or helko, meaning draws. We're also concerned with its use when it has a direct object like him. Well, so the most popular place I see non-Calvinists turn for support for an invite or enable or woo kind of meaning is in Nehemiah 9.30. Many years you were patient with them, yet they would not listen. Now, what that sounds like is God was drawing whatever, you know, was doing whatever Helkuo means but they refused. They didn't. Uh, a change of position was not affected. That is what is being claimed by the non-Calvinist who points to Nehemiah 930, 930 as support for a wooing or enticing meaning. Okay, that that is, I think, in my estimation, a very clear understanding of what Nehemiah nine thirty is about. Um, in fact, you see this throughout Scripture. You see this, for example. In Psalm 81, hear my, hear, O my people, I will admonish you, O Israel, if you would just listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. She shall not bow to down to a foreign God. I am your Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will feel it. But my people did not listen to my voice. What's that connoting? He wants them to listen to his voice. He wants them to submit to him, but Israel would not submit to me. Okay? He wants them to do that. He's expressing his desire for something that they're not doing, just like Matthew 23, 37. I long together your people, your children, under my wings, but you are not willing, O house of Israel. Over and over again, we see this kind of vocabulary. So what happens? What does God do in response? Look at verse 12. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. What does that sound like? Judicial hardening that we talk about here all the time. So it's not a unilateral hardening from birth. It's a judicial hardening because they refuse to listen. They refuse to submit to his voice. They refuse to hear him. And I give them over to their own hearts to follow their own counsels. In other words, I, I'll let them go their own way. If you want to go into the far country and squander your wealth, your inheritance, like with the prodigal son, I'm going to let you go your own way. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that, how, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. What does this sound like? It sounds like God desiring and longing to draw, to have his people listen to him, to follow in his ways, and they are unwilling. That's the, the I have about 14 of these kinds of verses throughout the Old and New Testament of God's expression of his desire and his longing for something that people are not willing to do, okay? And that is exactly the connotation of what you see here in Nehemiah. You were patient with them 
for many years, and your spirit warned them through your prophets, but you would not listen. Therefore, you handed them over to the surrounding people. So the the clear indication, it seems to me, but the base reading of this text is that God desired something for them, is being patient, bearing with them. The word helco is used in the sense that he's drawing with them or patient with them or longing with them, wanting them to come. And just look at this particular translation. This is the CSB, but you can even go to the ESV, which is, um, you know, usually, oh goodness, not sure why it's refusing to connect. But anyway, the, the ESV says he's patient with them or he bore with them with great patience. All of them say basically the same kind of, of vernacular. Not one of them, not even one translation, says anything remotely close to what you're about to hear Chris Date suggest that this text actually means. Just keep that in mind. But if you know Greek at all, you might notice something already given what I've put in contrast with it above. Notice how that in John 64, 644, him, Altan, is colored red, meaning it's, the, because, and I've colored it that way because it's the direct object of the word draws. But look what's following Helkusas in Nehemiah 930. Ep autus. If you are at all familiar with Greek, you will recognize ep as a shortened preposition. You see, it's not you helcode them, it's you hell code with them. It's a pre How does that work? How do you compel with somebody? How do you effectually draw with somebody? So is, is God getting with the people of Israel and effectually drawing, compelling with them somewhere? Again, you're not, you're, and maybe, I admit, it may be a lack of ability on my part to understand Chris, because Chris, you're at a level that I'm not at. I'm admitting ignorance here. I don't understand how you think pointing out the preposition here helps your case, that he is bearing with them, that he is um, longing with them, that he is patient with them. That seems to be a much better translation than what you go on to make the case for. Uh, and the fact that every translator translates it as God being patient with them and long suffering with them. And I, I don't know. I, I have to admit ignorance with regard to what it is you're trying to make a case for by saying that the word helco here, which you say has to have an effective change, must therefore be that somehow he's, he's and, and again, you'll go on to give your, I'll, I'll hear you out, because he goes on to give what his translation is, but you just have to ask yourself, is it the basic reading of the text, or is it any reading of any translator out there? A positional phrase, it's not the verb's direct object. Now, either that means the word is being used intransitively, in which case it really tells us nothing about what the word could mean in John 6.44 where it's being used transitively. In fact, not only is it not being used transitively in this case, it's also not being used as a passive verb uh, upon uh, th 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 that, a, that a subject is being act upon, acted upon passively, right? Because it's not an inanimate object, it's a actual people that have wills. That, that could be the reason. It would be completely irrelevant to the meaning of it, to what its meaning is in John 6:44. But as it turns out, there may in fact be a direct object here. The words "ete pala" many years are in the accusative. So it's conceivable that what the translators of the Septuagint are saying, and, and this is um, this seems to me very plausible with the Hebrew as well, is that God helcoed many years for them or with them or to them or whatever. You see, if many years is accusative, well, then actually, we might say that God extended many years to them. Well, that would be a, a change of position from a short span to a longer span, right? He's extending their many years. Or maybe, it say, or maybe it's saying he prolonged many years for them, which again is to affect the change from short to long. Or maybe it means he delayed many years for them on their behalf. Why? Chris, why is he delaying many years on their behalf? Is he waiting for his effectual drawing to take place? 
What's that? What does that mean? What, what is he delaying for? This sounds like Second Peter three nine. I'm patient with you, not wanting any to perish. And it goes on to talk about how he he's long suffering with them, and he's waiting on them, and he's longing for them. Patient with them. That means waiting on them. What are you waiting on? Un, under Calvinism, his decree, his effectual drawing. Why is he giving them more years? You you have to ask yourself that question. And why is there not a single translator in all of Scripture that even mentions that as a possible reading of this text? Again, that doesn't prove that you're wrong. I'm not saying it does. But it certainly draws doubt as to why all the translators of Nehemiah 930 got it wrong. Many years, even the ESV says, you bore with them, right? That's the ESV. Um, Let's look at the... Let's go to King James Version. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, wait for them, long for them. Okay? So it's not forbearing the years, it's forbearing them. It's for, forbearing the persons, the people, for many years. And so even if you were to translate it your way, it still is not helping your case a lot because you've got people who he desires to come who are not willing to come. So he's lengthening the years in order to delay their being judged. How does that work on your perspective? I went through every single one of these translations. Not a single one translated as what you heard Chris Dake translate it, as to mean that he is delaying or prolonging. And by the way, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. There are Greek words like the word used in Luke 12.45. The word for delayed or prolonged is the word uh, chronizo. I'm not properly pronouncing that exactly right. Chronizo, which is to delay or to prolong. Why wouldn't the Septuagint writers use that word if the meaning was what you say? In other words, the reason I point that out is they have at their disposal many words that they can choose from. Why would they use Helco in this scenario to use this as their text? I think it's because this word can be understood that way in this range of meaning when talking about not inanimate objects, but actual people with wills. Because the Hebrew of this word, as I point out in my debate, is Meshach. Let me, matter of fact, let me just put that back up on the screen. Here's Nehemiah 930. Remember the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And it's literally translated, you have drawn, helco, them for many years and testified against them by, by your spirit, the hand of your prophets, and they have not listened. So even though he's hell code with them, if you want to put it that way, even though he's prolonged many years, even if you want to put it Chris's way, they still have not listened despite God's desire for them to do this. That's the point that Chris seems to be overlooking. And it's the bigger point. It seems like the whole, you can't see the forest for the trees. It feels like that with Chris in this. He seems so micro-focused on the syntax and the grammar that he's not seeing the clear meaning of the text as God desiring and longing for the salvation of his people and wanting them to come and listen and them being unwilling. That's that's the context of this verse and the clear meaning of it, in my estimation. That same Hebrew word that's used in Nehemiah 9.30 that's translated into the word helko is the word meshach, okay? And it's also used in several other texts, one of which is Hosea 11, 4 and 5, which says, I drew them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke of their jaws. Yet, he goes on, because they have refused to return to me. Okay? So he gives them over, bends down from them, he will not return to the land of Egypt because they refuse to return to me. So even though he drew them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, they still refuse to come to him. Using the word meshach, which is exactly the same word that's used in Nehemiah 9.30, that the Authors of the Septuagint, who know Greek very well, obviously, translated with the word helco. I think that's pretty significant. I understand Chris Date doesn't. And what, again, I'm not trying to be mean to Chris, but what it, I'm telling you what it seems like to me. Just like he told you very honestly what he thinks of me, I can tell you, this seems like a man who is desperate to make his system fit the scripture. That's what it feels like to me. It feels like he's going every which way he can possibly go to make sure the syntax and the grammar can make his determinism work. That's what it felt like when I listened to what he was saying. I know it's not what he's feeling. That's what it feels like to me, watching and and listening to a brother I love and I care about. It feels like he's striving to hang on with everything he's got 
to his determinism, and he is willing to focus on whatever he has to micro focus on in order to make it work with his systematic. And again, I know that's probably not his intention, but that's the way it feels to me when I, when I hear this kind of uh, vernacular. Years for them on their behalf. We've got Antiquities of the Jews 545, drew them a great way. Now it's done psychologically, right? Um, the, the person in view here pretends to retreat and it is because they uh, pretend to retreat that the attacking army is drawn away. They, they follow after the person who pretends to retreat. But just because it's not done via force doesn't mean it doesn't affect the change of position. It does. That's the whole point of this text. He well, well, that's because it worked, Chris. <laughs> what if the general in the other army saw what the people were doing and said, hey, they're retreating, but they that's because they want us to... To, to follow them. And so we're not going to do that. Then, then the text would say they purposed to draw them or they tried to draw them or they wanted to draw them, but did not. It failed. Okay. And they would still use the word Helco. It would still be the same exact word. The fact that it actually happened because the people decided freely to follow the retreaters into their trap then this is the way, obviously, it would be recorded in Joey Cephas's writings. So I'm not sure how that that proves your position to demonstrate how it 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 it's a it's a narrative showing that it affected a change of position. Yeah, in that case, it did, but it doesn't necessarily mean it had to. It doesn't mean they could not have seen the trap and resisted going into it, even though the purpose of retreating was to draw them in to helco them in. Uh, it could have failed. Affected a change of position by pretending to retreat he drew them so yes it it, ref, it refers to a uh, a drawing that affects a change of position here it does too in antiquities 13 992 for the same reason he drew jonathan it means the same thing in antiquities 1527 he purposed by this to entice antony to hedonism with himself now here's the thing if you look in this text um he doesn't actually succeed. But notice it doesn't say, if I'm remembering correctly, anyway, notice it doesn't say he enticed Antony to hedonism, but, but Antony didn't reply. No, it says he intended to entice Antony to hedonism, but failed. Okay, this is when you've unfalsified your view. Because the same word is used when the enticement works, like in the first example there, as it is when it doesn't work, the second example there because he purposes to entice. The, the army purposed to entice them. In the first one, it worked, and the word Helco is used. In the second one, it didn't work, and the same word is used, Helco. And yet he still claims that it can't be used to support the concept and idea of God drawing people and it not effectuating a decision that he purposed for it to do. What, what word do you suppose needs to be used? What, what word should he have used? In other words, I, I don't know how this is making your case, Chris. I honestly don't. Had he succeeded, then Antony would have been enticed. But he didn't, so he wasn't enticed. He wasn't Helku-ode. He wasn't Helko-ode. No, he was, he was, but it failed. He purposed to entice him. He tried to entice him, but Anthony refused, okay? So look at the screen. It says, he purposed by this to entice Anthony to hedonism, but Anthony resisted, right? What would that sentence say if he had succeeded? In other words, if, if Joe East, Josephus was writing about Anthony and it actually did entice him and he succeeded in, in his enticement, okay, what would it say? It would just say he enticed Helco Anthony to hedonism. But what's similar with both of these? The word Helco is used in both of them, okay? So what does that tell you? Well, what if God is purposing to draw the world to himself? But many resisted. Do you see the point? God may have a purpose to draw the world to himself, not when Christ is still on earth, but only after he accomplishes his purpose through the resurrection and he's raised up, then he will draw all men to himself. And God's purpose, therefore, is being accomplished by not drawing all to himself during the time of John 6, 44, because he's not entrusting himself to all people at that time, but only after he's crucified and resurrected does he send the message to go both to the Jew, the Gentile, and to every man, woman, boy, and girl, that he sends the gospel to go to all peoples of the world, right? So God, what? Purposes to draw the world to himself, but many resisted. 
the word Helco works perfectly well right there. And yet people can still resist. And that's one of his own examples. There's several like this that Chris gives that I'm going, he really thinks that supports his case. I, I don't see it. And again, it may be, I, honest, I'm, I'm confessing right now, it may be a failing on my ability to, to understand Greek grammar. You, any, my wife will tell you, I get her to check my grammar because I'm not, you know, you guys know me, I mispronounce words. My grammar is just as bad. I'm not the grammatician that Chris is. He exceeds my abilities there. But again, I'm not basing this just on what I believe and say. I'm reading other people here. And, I, and I'm just confessing, I do not see how he thinks this makes his case. I honestly don't. And maybe that's why he doesn't think I'm serious, I guess. But I'm seriously trying to engage him. But I, I am not convinced. And it seems to me BDAG's not convinced because of what they said in their book. Uh, it, it seems to me at least um, the translators, every single translator of the English language of the Bible so far, are in agreement with me with regard to the meaning of what Nehemiah 9.30 says. And so I, I feel like I'm not standing out on an island by myself here. I think I'm pretty safe uh, firmly on the grounds that I'm standing on with regard to my particular understanding of the grammar of this text. Um, nevertheless, let's move Let's move on. Second Samuel 22.17, he sent from above and took me. He drew me out of many waters. Again, refers to an affected change of position. Okay, so I, I really want to, the reason I, I put this one in here, because um, he, he affected a change that's um, 2 Samuel, I mean, uh, yeah, 2 Samuel twenty two seventeen. Notice what he's saying there. He sent from above and took me. He drew me out of many waters. He grabs his shirt. He drew me out, okay? This is where I want to get to the second point that Chris doesn't address. And again, I'm not trying to, to, to get mad at Chris or, or accusatory towards Chris, he might be saying, you know what, I'm just going to focus on the first defeater of Leighton's argument, the effectuality argument. I'm not going to deal with the unconditional aspect of the argument, even though that's the bigger portion of it, even though that's the more significant portion, even though that's the, I think, the stronger uh, of the two defeaters. Um, we're just going to focus on Helco's use of effectuality and how it's used, okay? But I would like to turn the attention onto the unconditionality of the drawing by looking at 2 Samuel 22, 17 as, as one of examples for this. And so remember what I said at the very beginning, that there's two burdens for the Calvinist, for Chris. To has, John 6, 44 says what he needs it to say. It has to be effectual, okay, which I don't think they've met that burden based upon the reasons that we've already argued, but they could be right, okay? And this is why he thinks maybe he calls some of these other guys serious is because they often say things like, well, you might be right about that. You you know, you make a valid point here. And maybe I don't say that enough to be considered serious by Chris. I, I'm not sure. Or I, like uh, um, uh, Paulman, I have to be convinced of one of his arguments in order to be starting to be taken seriously. In other words, uh, he uses that as one of the examples. Uh, you know, uh, Paulman was uh, convinced of one of Chris State's points, and now he, he thinks David Paulman is more serious than I am, I guess. So I guess that's the criteria of being serious, is that I have to be convinced by something Chris says. I don't know, but I'm, I'm working on it, Chris. I'm trying to be serious enough for you. Um, nevertheless, uh, moving on. Look at what Second Samuel 22 says. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters, okay? So you might call this an effectual drawing. And you know what? I'd probably be okay with that. Just like Matt Chisholm with the Bible Rowdown and Billy Wendelin with the, the Bible Rowdown. Just like our favorite Dillard's employee, David Paulman, believes it's probably effectual. And we could be fine with that. As a matter of fact, let's just say it is so Chris can be happy, okay? <laughs> Chris, you convinced us all. It's effectual, okay, fine. Okay, so let's, let's let it be effectual. Is it unconditional? Is he reaching down from on high and taking hold of him and drawing him out of deep waters unconditionally, Chris Date? Because that's what you need it to say to be Calvinistic. Let's keep reading. Verse 18, he rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. He confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me into spacious space. He wrecked me because he delighted in me. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanliness of my hands. He has rewarded me. In other words, what's cleanliness of hands refer to? Repentance. But he's not saying he's perfect, okay? He's clean. His hands are clean because he has humbled himself 
and confessed his sin. He has believed in the Father. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I'm not guilty from turning from my God. In other words, I, I'm, I'm, I'm remaining faithful. I've not bowed a knee to, knee to Baal, so to speak. I'm remaining faithful. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the Father. I'm sticking with him. All his laws are before me, and I'm not turned away from his decrees. I've, I've been blameless before him. I've kept my, uh, myself from sin. The Lord has re- rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanliness in his sight. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To the blameless you show yourself blameless. To the pure you show yourself pure. But to the de- devious you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty and bring them low. Now, some people might read some of that and say, oh, he looks like he's being prideful there. No, he's reflecting upon the cleanliness of the one in whom he believes. This is what we were talking about with the whole uh, uh, choice meets argument, is that there's verses like this which seem to describe people as being righteous and good, and really what they're reflecting upon is the goodness and the righteousness of the one they believe in, who they are faithful to. I believe and trust in his faithfulness. I am. You, you have shown yourself to be faithful to those who remain with faith in you, who trust in you. That's the, that's the context here. So notice, who does he draw out of deep waters? Those who believe and trust in his name. Those who humble themselves and put faith in him. In other words, he's not just unilaterally picking people before they're born and drawing them out of waters. Got it? He is drawing out of waters those who are faithful. The faithful. Though he saves the humble, verse 28. Save the humble. So he's not saving unconditionally or unilaterally. He's saving the humble. But whose eyes who are haughty, he brings them low. Keep that in mind because I think that's really important to understanding this. Let's look at the next slide. This was from the debate in John 6. Go back to John 6 now and keep this unconditional concept in mind because this is the bigger of the two points that's not really being addressed by Chris, nor many other Calvinists for that matter. They're hyper-focused upon the use of the concept of effectuality within the word helco. The audience is rebellious. They are judicially hardened Israelites who are complaining because they don't understand Jesus' parables about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. They think he's blasphemous by claiming to be from heaven. So Jesus tells them that they are unable to come unless the Father enables or draws them to come. Okay, And who does God enable to come to Jesus according to verse 45? The very next verse, it tells us exactly what condition he would draw somebody to Christ, okay? What condition they must meet, right? Who does God enable to come to Jesus? Who does he draw to Jesus? Those who have heard and learned from the Father, which is exactly why Jesus said in verse 45, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Remember, nobody comes to him unless they're drawn by the Father. But who is the Father going to draw to the Son like he did Cornelius? Cornelius was a God-fearing man. He was a God-fearing Gentile who gave alms to the poor, whose prayers went up as a memorial before the Father, according to the angel. And what does God do? He draws him to the Son. And therefore, Cornelius will be compelled, if you want to use compelled, okay. He effectually draws him to the Son. But he's not doing it unilaterally or you might say arbitrarily, according to the appropriate definitions, right? Unilaterally, just picking people and drawing them to the Son. What's he doing? He is choosing those who are faithful, the faithful in Christ Jesus, the faithful in God, those who have faith in God, those like Psalm 25 says. He reveals the covenant to whom? Those who fear the Lord. Psalm 25 is very clear to say, here's who he's going to guide in the way they should choose those who humble themselves and who fear me, who trust in my ways. That's what Psalm 25 says. So it's not just he unilaterally picks people and draws them and shows them the way of the covenant and helps them to choose. No, he's choosing those who have feared him, who have trusted in him to give to the Son. So it's not just an arbitrary choice. So there, you've got to keep this in mind. In the time of Christ, there are two types of people prior to Christ's coming. There are God-fearing people like Simeon, for example, Cornelius, as we mentioned. Lydia would be a good example of a God-fearing woman, right? She heard and learned from the Father. She was a believer in God the Father, but did not yet know of Jesus of Nazareth, who dies on a cross for her sins. She doesn't know about that. Cornelius doesn't know it, but she, but they are God-fearing people. And so there's a reason for this. Matter of fact, this is a slide from the debate, by the way, guys. A large portion of my debate was focusing on this exact point which was virtually ignored so far, 
Okay? So these are God-fearing people that he is drawing, hell even by Chris's own definition of the word hell He is, what, what, what do we say before? Effectuating a change of position for Cornelius to be outside of Christ to being in Christ. He's effectuating a change of position for those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. The listeners and learners from the Father, he's hell them to be in the Son. So, Chris, I have brought defeaters for both of those, and you only addressed one of them, and I don't think you convinced me of the one that you were trying to. Okay, I still, maybe to be serious, you have to, I have to let you convince me. But a defeater is, and a defeater in a debate is say, even if we grant you that, and so that's what I'm saying, even if we were to grant Chris his, his argument and say, okay, Helco means to effectuate a change of position in an effectual way that the person's drawing you to salvation, it absolutely must mean that. Even if that's right, you still don't have Calvinism because there is a clearly stated reason as to why he is Helcoing people to Christ, and that is because they are listeners and learners from the Father. Um, this is why I quoted from Psalm 25 earlier, which I put right there. Who is the one who fears the Lord? This is Psalm 25, 12, and 14. Who is the one who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way sh- he should choose. So who does God instruct in the way he should choose? People unilaterally pick before the foundation of the world for no apparent reason. We just don't know why. He just picks certain people, and he instructs them the way they should choose. Or does he instruct god fears in the way they should choose? What does the psalmist say? What does the inspired word of God say? Okay. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. So who does he make his covenant known to? Who would he make the new covenant of Christ by grace through faith? Who would he make that new covenant known to? Those who fear him. Okay. So it's not an unconditional choice. It's a choice conditioned upon the fact that they believe in God the Father. Therefore, while Christ is on heaven, on earth, he would entrust them to the Son. He would draw them to the Son. And it's not until he's lifted up that he actually takes that message to the entire world for anyone and everyone to be drawn to the, to the Father and to the Son and to the, through the Holy Spirit's uh, witness, obviously. And so Pastor Gabe actually mentioned this in one of his broadcasts, which I brought to the attention of the listeners in the debate when he said this. He said, if these Jews had been listening to the Old Testament scriptures, if they had been listening to Moses and the prophets, they would know who Jesus is. Would they, Gabe? Would they? If, if they had been listening to the Old Testament scriptures, if they had been listening to Moses and the prophets, and they listened and learned from Moses and the prophets and the Father, would they know who Jesus is? According to your own words, they would. In other words, what would they be? They would be compelled to believe in the Son. They would be given by the Father to the Son if they had been listening to Moses and the prophets. Right? It's exactly what you're making the point of, it seems to, in this quote. And you would come to him, and they would come to him because they would have known the Father through the Word of God. So they would have known the Father, and so what they would, what would they have done? They would have known the Father, therefore they would have heard the voice of the Son, and they would have believed because sheep recognize their shepherd's voice. And the Father and the Son speak the same thing. That's why when Jesus says in John chapter 10, you don't believe in me because you're not a sheep. What are the Calvinists here? Well, you don't believe in me because you're not elect, you're not wanted. I didn't choose you. I didn't want you. That's what the Calvinists here. No. What is, what is he saying? He's saying, you don't believe in me, the son, because you're not a follower. That's what a sheep is, a follower. You're not a follower of the father. If you followed the father, you would believe me because I and the father speak the same thing, which is exactly what he goes on to say in John chapter 10. And he has said it a dozen other times earlier in the chapter and throughout the text where when you go study these things. He talks about all the time, I don't say anything that the father hasn't told me to say. I'm speaking the same exact voice as my father speaks. And therefore, if you recognize his voice because you listen and learn from him, you would know that I'm the son because you would recognize my voice because we have the same voice. You don't believe because you're not a follower of the father. You're not a sheep. That's what he means. Francisco, thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate that very much. Um, And so it seems we both agree on one point, Uh, Pastor Gabe and I, according to that, that particular quote, provision, but both of us seem to agree that had they listened and learned from the Father, in other words, had they listened to Moses, had they listened and learned from the Father and believed in the Father prior to Christ's coming, then they would have come to the Son, okay? So what really is our theological difference? According to my debate, which Chris says he's critiquing, but yet he's, I doesn't cover any of this as far as I know, okay? What's, what's actually the difference between our two perspectives, if that's the case? Under provisionism, everyone is born responsible. 
for what they hear from the Father, meaning they are able to respond to his drawing by either suppressing the truth or accepting it. In other words, God draws all people. That makes pretty good sense, doesn't it? God draws all people, and therefore everyone is responsible for what they do with how he draws them, either through the revelation that they saw in the Old Testament, the revelation through nature, through conscience, or through special revelation, i.e. further revelation as to who the Son is and how he's accomplishing his purpose of bringing reconciliation to the world through the sacrifice of his own Son. Calvinists seem to think everyone is born unable to hear and learn from the Father unless unconditionally elected and effectually graced. In other words, God does not really draw all people to himself. And I don't think that that can be supported in the text. And this is why we brought up John 12, 32 in the debate, was to point out, as it says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now, I, I don't have a clip of it, but Chris does um, address this argument. And he addresses my argument against the concept and idea that this would promote universalism if the word draw is taken uh, to mean all without exception, okay? Um, every single person. And he makes the case to say this is actually drawing all types or all kinds of people. Um, and we, we would just push back against that, reminding people that it even can mean all without distinction to some degree, okay? Um, we can understand that it means it can mean all without distinction to, in some regard. But that just because something is all without distinction doesn't mean it's also all without it. It's not all without exception, as we've talked about before. Um, if if you have uh, people in the land, a sheriff comes to a new town, and the elite, the upper class, are are saying you know are, are getting away with breaking laws because they have all the money, uh, and the new sheriff in town comes in and he addresses this thing, this problem happen, happening, and he makes a statement: every single person is subject to the laws of the land. Now, is he addressing all without distinction? Of course he is. That's exactly what he's talking about. All without distinction are subject to the law of the land. Now, suppose somebody's stepping in and saying, oh, what he means, therefore, because he's addressing all classes of people, rich and poor classes, because he's addressing that, therefore, what he really means is some, a few of all kinds of people are subject to the laws of the land. That's what he really means, because he's addressing all without distinction. No. Obviously, the context of that that quote, that every single person is under the subject is subject to the law of the land, addressing the concept and idea that the upper class don't think they're subject to the laws of the land, still incorporates within that statement that every single person, without exception, is subject to the law of the land regardless of their class, and so too, everyone will be drawn regardless of their class, and when you were, use the word cosmos to connote this. You're certainly including a more inclusive or wider range of idea. It certainly doesn't mean a few of all kinds, which is what Calvinists would have to think it means. And when you take into account what we see in Mark 9, 9, for example, where he says, coming down from the mountain, wait until the Son of Man has been risen from the dead. In other words, after I am lifted up from the earth, then you can tell people what you've seen here today on the mountain. In other words, he doesn't want them to tell until he accomplishes redemption. And then he will draw all people to himself. Meaning what? He will send the message to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. But saying, I will send the message to the Jews and the Gentiles alike, certainly does not mean or even connote the concept and idea, I will effectually draw few of all kinds of people, as Chris's reading would, would entail. So if you compare each view side by side of John 12, 32, you got provisionism on one side that says Christ will draw all people to himself after he accomplishes his purpose here on earth and ascends into heaven. In other words, once he's raised up, once he's accomplished his purpose, he will send the gospel to go to the highways and the byways, to the good and the bad alike, to every single man, woman, boy, and girl, so as to draw all to himself. Okay. On Calvinism, their reading of that is God irresistibly draws a few of all kinds of people through effectual means, irresistibly draws them, to believe while leaving the rest of mankind in their innate hopeless condition from birth. Which one makes more sense to you, given the whole of Scripture and the context and the use of the word cosmos, world, in John 12 and elsewhere in the book of John? Go do a word study on the word cosmos, the word world, throughout the book of John and tell me where it ever could be translated to mean few of all kinds of people. It just does not fit, and it does not make much sense within the context. So listen, when I say this, all kinds 
does not equal a few of all kinds. So I can even concede what he reads there in the in the uh, his video. He reads through BDAG and several other um, dictionaries and lexicons and says, you know, look, look, all here, pos here, it can mean all kinds. It can mean all kinds. Okay, fine. It, mean, it can mean all kinds. When Jesus is lifted up, he will draw all kinds of people to himself. He will draw Jew and Gentile, male, women, female. He will draw all kinds of people to himself. But that does not mean a few of all kinds, irresistibly. Surely, you can't take that big of a leap just by saying, because he's saying all without distinction, therefore, it can't mean all without exception, especially when the word world, cosmos, is being used. Again, refocus this. All without distinction does not necessarily preclude all without exception. Yes, it might be that Jesus was trying to say, this is not just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. And I will draw all people, slave, free, male, female, young, old, I will draw them all. But to step in and read into that, therefore, that means God effectually, irresistibly draws a few of all kinds is a gross misreading, in my estimation, of this text. And, and it completely misaligns, I think, the intention of the author um, and many others. I could go on for much, much longer, obviously, uh, talking through some of these things, but I, I want to be um, a little better on time. And we're at that, oh, an hour and 11 minutes. We, I'm much shorter than both of Chris's videos, so at least I can say that. At least I can brag on that point, uh, if nothing else. Um, but I, I do want to leave you with that and remind you, as I did at the beginning, um, if you can help support us and help us uh, to uh, advertise, to get the word out, to like, to share, to subscribe, all of those things that I'm supposed to ask you every single time I do a broadcast and I uh, inevitably forget to do so. And then I'm reminded of, of how people are, are depending upon that. Uh, and so we, we have to get the word out. Um, we're a drop in the bucket compared to many of the Calvinistic resources out there. And so we need your help to, to become a monthly patron, uh, to, to make a one-time gift. Um, to, to like, to share, to share this on your social media pages. All of those things make a, a huge difference for us, and we really appreciate those who give on a regular basis to make this happen. And I appreciate the side comments. I know there's uh, arguments going on on the side. I love the, y'all the, theology geeks and all the debates that go on in the side chats. Uh, that's one of the fun things about doing uh, broadcasts like this is that you have a, a platform in which you can discuss these things. But remember, do, do so in love. Um, I love Chris. Um, he and I disagree, obviously, pretty uh, strongly with each other with regard to some of these things. But um, I, I genuinely, as he said to me, I genuinely care about him. I, I think um, he's he's got a, a huge uh, influence and potential in his ministry and what he's going to do in his professional life because of his um, uh, his his meticulous nature and his uh, carefulness and seriousness, if you will. I've been using that word a lot with um, with the things that he handles, and he does handle things. Um, uh, most things I agree with him about, by the way. We just happen to be on this broadcast uh, often talking about the things we disagree upon. But um, I, I hope that you hear it in the, in the spirit in which it's intended and that you will hopefully practice similar um, behaviors in your own engagements with other people online. Um, as we put at the top of our page, um, you know, persuasiveness increases with uh, the sweetness of speech. Um, the Proverbs teaches that because we're, we're more persuasive. You win more flies with honey than with vinegar, as it said. You're more persuasive when you show respect, when you're kind to one another, when you uh, do your best to say, I understand, before you say, I disagree. Um, and, and that's not always easy to do. I fail often, and, and, I, and I strive to set that example here, but I, I hope that you will uh, continue to, to make that as a, a priority, uh, especially if you're going to claim the name as a provisionist, as one who believes in God's love for all people treat even, yes, your enemies, your theological enemies or your uh, pagan enemies, either one, with love, because that's exactly what Scripture calls us to do. So go now, share Christ, and show love.